morning and thanks for staying tuned. Welcome to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. My name is Ladi Akkeri Duluali. The headlines. Head of regional military administration in a Ukraine's region says Russian overnight strikes caused serious destruction at Kervera Power Facility. Ukraine forced to introduce scheduled blackouts nationwide following days of Russian missile attacks. And U.S. State Department says Vladimir Putin's resort to martial law is no surprise. Welcome once again, the head of the no, Pretovax Regional Military Administration, Valentin Roshnyshenko, says an energy infrastructure facility and an industrial area were struck overnight in Ukraine's central Kivari province, causing, quote, serious destruction. He says it was a nerve-wracking night in that region, and response teams are at work as we speak, adding that initial reports are of no casualties. In other areas, the night passed without emergencies, and currently things appear to be calm. Meanwhile, a missile strikes uh, hit an administrative building in Enahoda in Russian-controlled Ukraine. CCTV footage shows the moment of the blast. The location of the video was verified by buildings and road layout, which matched Google Street view imagery uh, from the area. Date and timestamps shown on the CCTV footage match corroborating reports of the blasts. Uh, Dmitry Orlov, the Ukrainian mayor of Enahoda, said in a post on social media that the city was under shelling all night. He added that there were reports that buildings of the executive committee of the city council were also damaged. Russia's defense ministry said in a social uh, a media statement that the Ukrainian armed forces artillery had fired 13 missiles on the northern outskirts of the city of Enohoda and the territory neighboring the nuclear power plant contained there. And a Russian military strike hit a thermal power station in the city of Bushtin in western Ukraine, the latest in a wave of attacks by Moscow on critical infrastructure. Svetlana Onetschuk, governor of the region of ivano frankivsk says, quote, our region experienced missile fire today once again. The Bushtin thermal power station was hit, which caused a fire. She adds that no one was hurt. Ukrainian cities have been struck in recent days by drones and missiles, and Vitaly Klitschko, Kiev's mayor, says the capital's air defenses had been in action once again overnight. And energy officials in Ukraine said they had no choice but to introduce emergency and scheduled blackouts after losing at least 40% of the country's power-generating capacity following days of devastating Russian cruise missile and drone strikes. Alexander Kachenko, an advisor to Ukraine's energy minister, said in a statement that, according to new data, about 40% of the total infrastructure and generating capacities have been seriously damaged, adding that restoration and repair work are ongoing, but miracles are possible only to a certain extent. The NPC's Okernego, Ukraine's national energy company, uh, has asked for the understanding and support of its energy users as they've been forced to introduce consumption restrictions following the attacks. The U.S. Justice Department has announced charges uh, against nearly a dozen people and two companies in connection with, quote, illegal schemes to send military technology to Russia some of which have allegedly been recovered from battlefields in Ukraine. The department said in a statement that some of the defendants also tried to send nuclear proliferation technology to Russia, but that it was intercepted before it arrived. According to Attorney General Merrick Garland, these charges reveal two separate global schemes to violate U.S. export and sanctions laws, including by shipping sensitive military technologies from U.S. manufacturers including types found in seized Russian weapons platforms in Ukraine and attempting to re-export a machine system with potential application in nuclear proliferation and defense programs to Russia. And the United States says it is no surprise Russia was resorting to desperate 
tactics after Russian President Vladimir Putin declared martial law in four partially occupied regions of Ukraine that Russia now claims as its own. State Department Deputy Spokesperson Vedan Patel says it should be no surprise to anyone that Russia is resorting to desperate tactics to try and enforce control in these areas. Should be no surprise to anybody that Russia is resorting to desperate tactics to try and enforce control in these areas. Uh, the truth is, is that Russia is not wanted in these regions and the people of Ukraine are rejecting Russia's illegal invasion and seizure by force of what is Ukrainian territory. Uh, no matter what the Kremlin says or does, uh, no matter what they try to enact via decree, via paper or otherwise, Crimea, Donetsk, Kherson, Luhansk, and Zaporizhia are Ukrainian <clears throat> sovereign territory. And any claim that Russia makes over these territories is illegitimate. Uh, they have no legal claim whatsoever. There is no jurisdiction that they have over those territories. Uh, this is Ukraine's land, and Russia has blatantly violated uh, Ukrainian sovereignty and territorial integrity, as well as violating the UN Charter with their illegal act. British Defense Minister Ben Wallace met his U.S. counterpart in Washington to discuss shared security concerns about the situation in Ukraine. Meanwhile, Britain's Chief of the Defence Staff, Tony Radikin, has urged the international community to remain united against what he called Russian President Vladimir Putin's deeply irresponsible nuclear rhetoric. Mr. Radikin says Russian President has few options left, hence his resort to nuclear threats. All right, let's talk now to our guest this morning, our first guest on the program, uh, Professor Dennis Soltis, Department of Public Administration and uh, International Development at the Kimap University in Almaty, Kazakhstan. Good morning to you, Professor Soltis. Nice to be with you once again. Uh, good morning. Nice to see you, too. Let's, uh, let, let's begin with the declaration of martial law, which happened yesterday. Um, some of the information I have, uh, I have read uh, indicates that um, in practical terms, what this does is that it gives uh, uh, license, uh, particularly to the Russians who have declared it, uh, to take extraordinary measures. But in reality, what kind of measures can they take? Already, those regions are not completely under their, their control, and they are, in fact, having to evacuate some uh, of the areas uh, ahead of a Ukrainian expected offensive. Uh, well, it gives them... Um some extra possibility to uh, struggle against the Ukrainian partisan movement, uh, which is uh, quite active in that area. So I don't know what exactly inv oh, well, is, is involved in um, uh, martial law. Well, there'll be a curfew. So anybody, you know, sneaking around after a certain time, seven o'clock at night or whatever, uh, can instantly be suspected of uh, being a partisan and, uh, well, stopped and arrested and tortured and killed or whatever. So it gives them extra leverage there. Uh, not, but, uh, but you're right. I mean, they've, they've already had license, you know, all the time to uh, torture people and do marauding. Um, so uh, it's maybe nothing more, uh, nothing much more unusual than what's been happening already. Uh, something else though that's ominous is, uh, is that they're uh, treating these four annexed regions as a sort of parts of Russia. So now they can, uh, in principle, mobilize native Ukrainians to fight in the Russian army against other Ukrainians. Uh, this is, well, dirty warfare, but that's what they do. Um, and it's quite clever because it keeps the ethnic Russian casualties low because nobody in Russia cares about... Uh, Ukrainians being, central Ukrainians being killed in central Ukraine, but also they don't care about uh, Ukrainians from the Donbass and Luhansk, because these are, uh, in principle, Ukrainian citizens. Uh, and, so no, and so if they are killed, as they are in large numbers, nobody in Russia, you know, uh, worries about them. <clears throat> so, uh, uh, yeah, it's quite ominous. A very dirty warfare. But that's where we are. You are in Kazakhstan, and Kazakhstan uh, was, shall we say, in a leading role uh, in a, a series of meetings that held a few days back. President Putin, in fact, uh, attended 
uh, 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 those meetings uh, about regional uh, security and economic cooperation. Um, do you think uh, he got what he wanted uh, by attending that event? And what was the immediate or medium-term reaction of some of the countries, particularly the stands of which you are in one, talking about Kazakhstan, but there are others, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, uh, and, uh, and so on, who were also at that meeting and are very close to Russia. Well, Kazakhstan is trying to tread a fine line. As far as the, uh, well, whatever you call them, refugees or draft dodgers, the government position is ostensibly humanitarian. So the government appealed to the uh, Kazakhstani population to, you know, treat these uh, these refugees well, uh, well, and also to keep good relations with with Russia. Uh, but they will not extradite these uh, refugees to Russia. So Kazakhstan is drawing a line there. Uh, Kazakhstan has always refused to uh, recognize the annex annexations of uh, uh, the Donbas and. Uh, and Luhansk and Crimea because they, because, uh, well, for, uh, for the uh, one obvious reason is because uh, some Russians uh, make claims on Kazakhstani territory also. Uh, so, and my, my understanding was that Putin got sort of, a, he wasn't warmly greeted. Uh, in fact, one of the, uh, uh, the, the president of uh, Uzbekistan, I think it was, one of them, I uh, was kind of critical of him as saying that, you know, you're treating us like, you know, second class citizens. You're not respecting us. Uh, so I don't think he got very much there. How about his meetings with the Chinese? I ask you because you, of course, have a unique perspective in all of this. Uh, uh, being where you are. Um, the Chinese have also become quite close to many of the countries uh, in that region. Um, but at the same time, Russia and China uh, uh, are very, very good friends and partners, although the role the Chinese are playing in this particular conflict up until now, at least officially, is not very clear. Uh, well, that relationship is kind of ambiguous also. Yet back at the Summer Khan conference, which was, what, about a month ago, uh, unprompted by any kind of Russian utterance, uh, Xi Jinping said that uh, uh, China will guarantee Kazakhstan's territorial integrity. So official Russia had not even made a threat yet against uh, Kazakhstan's territorial uh, integrity, but already uh, the Chinese are guaranteeing uh, Kazakhstan's safety. So um, China, I think, sees an opportunity or you know, obligation, perhaps, or whatever, uh, to uh, play a higher role here in the Central Asian countries. And the Central Asian countries, uh, well, sensibly have to hedge their bets. And, um, you know, uh, uh, in Kazakhstan, the Chinese declaration was, was welcome. I mean, it's always good when a foreign power, especially a major power, or at least rhetorically, says it will recognize your territorial integrity. Uh, so gradually, in the sphere of foreign relations, uh, Kazakhstan is, well, trying to maintain a, a, a neutral stance vis-a-vis -vis Russia. They're in an, in an, in an uncomfortable position, but uh, they're trying to be at least neutral. Uh, cert and yes, and certainly they're not in favor of the war in Ukraine, and the Kazakhstani population is uh, all on Ukraine's side. At the and bottom the of all of this, at the bottom of all of this uh, is the energy uh, shall we say, uh, uh, paradox. Paradox in the sense that everybody is talking about it, but at the same time, nobody is really pointing to it as a determinant of how this crisis has proceeded and how it may probably be concluded if it is going to be concluded. Now, many of the countries in, uh, uh, in the region where you are, in fact, produce oil as well. Uh, some of them are actually uh, uh, oil producers, uh, in some cases, major uh, uh, producers. But then the Russians have used their control of oil supplies, particularly gas supplies, uh, uh, to kind of maneuver through this. So how do you see the dynamic in that situation working? Because even within the European Union, which brings together some of the countries in the West and in the East, uh, this issue of energy 
is still divisive. They're supposed to meet uh, later on uh, today, if I understand that correctly, um, over the issue of price caps, because there are many countries in Europe that are still saying, look, we can't go with you on this. You are going to hurt our economies even further than they've already been hurt by the sanctions. Uh, oh, yeah, well, you're right. Uh, Russia blocks the overland routes. Well, one country, though, is a, is Azerbaijan. It's on the western side of the Caspian Sea, so it's not blocked by Russia. Uh, but there's lack of uh, capacity in the pipeline. I think that was the Baku Tsehan uh, pipeline. And, uh, and there was another one early on uh, that sort of never got off the ground. Uh, so Azerbaijan declared that it'd be willing to sell gas, and I suppose it is, but I think it has, you know, limited capacity. Azerbaijan would be only one of many countries uh, selling some small quantities of, of gas. Um, another issue here is LNG facilities. It's maybe the problem maybe isn't even with gas, but with transport and uh, and the conversion facilities to LNG, uh, liquid, liquefied natural gas. So uh, there are kind of technical problems. Uh, but yet still, as of about a month ago, um, the European Union countries as a whole already had filled 80% of their gas storage capacity to 80% uh, to capacity and, and higher, which is increasing quite rapidly. Uh, although I don't know how large these uh, the storage capacities are, and that is how how far they will take them into the winter. But of course, the Europeans have been you know scrambling to find gas, and uh, uh, well, there's lots of gas around the world. You just have to uh, have to go out and get it. And get it and get it to those who need to use it, which is the other mm -hmm. side of this, uh, 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 and the issue of prices. Uh, countries that produce. Uh, uh, gas uh, may not have much of a problem. You, you referenced Azerbaijan there, and there are a couple of others, uh, which because that either they produce or they're not too far from those who produce, they may not have too many logistic problems. But because of what, for example, has happened with Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2, which were the big ones that were taken from Russia to the countries in Europe that don't have uh, uh, supply or have very limited supply, uh, now there's a question of price. And that's where the economics come in, and that's where Russia's leverage because of size and infrastructure comes in. Uh, how do you see that working out? Do you think this might be the issue that tends to affect the unity of Europe, which has been unusually strong uh, since this crisis, uh, this invasion began in February? Uh, well, that's a good question. Uh, well, I probably the European countries will muddle through. They'll be, of course, conserving gas. They'll be looking for gas. Uh, so, you know, humans being inventive, they'll get through the winter somehow. But yes, uh, prices will go up. It'll make, you know, for inflation. Uh, but as you also said, the European countries have been um, unusually united. Uh, and this is where, uh, you know, uh, Putin's or the Kremlin's policies work at cross purposes because this egregious bombing of uh, residential areas in Ukraine, um, you know, has hardened European attitudes. Also, the Europeans are starting to realize that it'd be cheaper to supply Ukraine with weapons than after the fact to have to uh, help Ukraine reestablish its, uh, you know, damaged infrastructures, power stations and dams and whatever. So, um, the lights are sort of coming on for the Europeans, and it's it's cheaper to um, uh, increase aid to the Ukrainian military. Let me ask you one uh, final. Oh, sorry. Please go on. Please go on. I know. So, so we'll see what happens over the winter. <laughs> kind I of was an going. Open to, question. Yes, indeed. I was going to bring you home, uh, as it were, and talk to you about. Uh, day to day living in Kazakhstan. I mean, when we talk about all of this, we're talking. Uh, broad strokes. Uh, people talk about large numbers and, peop and people and so on. But when we bring it down, we're talking here about human survival, day-to-day -day living and so on. So I wanted to ask you, uh, as an academic uh, living in Kazakhstan, you get to meet a lot of people, your students, uh, colleagues, uh, you, you speak to each other and all of that. What is it like today and what is the difference between life in Kazakhstan on a day-to-day -day basis uh, in January this year 
and what is it like now? Are there any real differences? And if so, what are they and what impact are they having? Uh, no, outwardly, no. Everything is, is uh, calm the way it was before. The stores and restaurants were functioning. Uh, there were some cases of some friction, you know, some, not many. I don't want to, you know, overemphasize this. Uh, between the uh, draft dodgers and the uh, and, and some of the local people well the draft dodgers as a group are rather wealthy and so they started moving into uh, dormitories and apartments uh, which local people that is local landowners would be would w would be willing to rent to them for a higher price and so they were evicting uh, native Kazakh tenants uh, so there are kind of those ground level uh, um, sort of tensions but uh, uh, in general, um, the population is trying to accommodate the, the uh, Russian refugees, and uh, for the moment, it seems uh, fairly calm. Kazakhstan is you know, a middle-income country. It's fairly prosperous, uh, so um, you know, I think it can handle, uh, I think the number is 200,000 or maybe 100,000 now uh, 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 of these um, well, what do we call them? <laughs> Immigrants <laughs> we're, 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 we're still struggling with that. Do we call them draft dodgers or do we call them refugees, as you said at the beginning uh, of the program? And, and some of them can get jobs, you know, uh, working, say, for a local Russian business people. That's one way that they can um, stay here. And many of them get a job working for some kind of a Russian company, you know, or a restaurant or building company. Uh, they're supposed to, uh, yeah, register, or in principle, there's supposed to leave after 90 days or maybe they would or probably Kazakhstan will let them re-register um Kazakhstan is trying to register or register them and probably they will uh, have some kind of an easier process for them to for for those people who have jobs or you know are economically useful to to perhaps remain in Kazakhstan um the Kazakhstani government you know kind of sees these as a you know a, a valuable labor resource so uh there's that aspect too. Um, so, um, in general, um, yeah, everybody seems to be behaving for the moment. <laughs> indeed, indeed, uh, Professor uh, Dennis Saltis. Thank you for your time uh, today, and of course, uh, do continue to stay safe. Uh, uh, we wish you well. Uh, my pleasure. Take care. Take care of yourself. Thank you. Still to come on the program, EU gas price cap still elusive as leaders meet again over energy crunch. Please stay on with us. Thanks for staying tuned. Uh, welcome back. United States President Joe Biden says that Russian President Vladimir Putin is in, quote, an incredibly difficult position and is resorting to brutalizing Ukrainian citizens. He was speaking to reporters at the White House uh, uh, earlier on. I think that Vladimir Putin finds himself in an incredibly difficult position. And what it reflects to me is it seems his only tool available to him is to brutalize individual citizens in Ukraine, Ukrainian citizens, to try to intimidate them into capitulating. They're not going to do that. And we can now uh, bring you that story about the meeting between the defense ministers of uh, the uh, United States and Britain, who met in uh, Washington uh, to discuss shared security concerns about the situation in Ukraine. Uh, Britain's Chief of Defense Staff, Tony Rodakin, had earlier urged the international community to remain united against what he called President Vladimir Putin's deeply irresponsible nuclear rhetoric. Uh, sure. He has few options left, hence the nuclear rhetoric. And while this is worrying and deeply irresponsible, it is a sign of weakness, which is precisely why the international community needs to remain strong and united. I don't think you'll be surprised for me to, to duck giving you a precise uh, likelihood of, of, of where Russia is. I would just stress the recklessness of Russia using that language around 
nuclear and that this is a this is a, a, a desperate and reflects the weakness of Russia and we should we should continue to have the confidence that we have both in our own armed forces in our collective security that we get through NATO and in the wider security that we get from an international community that has remained steadfast throughout this conflict. Um, Admiral, thank you for that. In another development, Russia's deputy UN envoy says the country will reassess its cooperation with the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres and his staff if Mr. Guterres sends experts to Ukraine to inspect downed drones that Western powers say were made in Iran. Russia's deputy UN ambassador, Dmitry Polyansky, did not elaborate on what cooperation could be affected. Mr. Polyansky also told reporters he was not optimistic about the renewal of a UN brokered deal that resumed Ukraine's Black Sea exports of grain and fertilizer. No arms transfers in violation of Resolution 2231 have been ever conducted by Iran, and no drones were supplied by Iran to Russia for the use in the, in the conflict in Ukraine. And I would recommend that you do not underestimate technological capabilities of the Russian drone industry. I can tell you we know what we do and we know how to do it. But I can tell you that, uh, uh, first of all, the press secretary of the president said that they are Russian-made. Secondly, when you see uh, the debris on the ground after they hit the targets, you would see inscriptions in Russian on, on the shell. So uh, I don't think that Russian is very much uh, widely used in, in Iran. Uh, I also heard that uh, if you speak about Iranian drones, so they have the shape of some kind of American drones, they were copied from it. So can we say that Russian drones are resembling American drones or whatever? It's, it's very difficult uh, game of the words. But I would say that uh, we have our drone industry, which produces uh, the things that we need for this campaign. Meanwhile, Supreme Leader of Iran, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, has loaded the country's, quote, dangerous drones and mocked the collective West for initially dismissing its UAV program as a propaganda stunt. The Supreme Leader made the remarks while speaking to Iranian academics and intellectuals. Ayatollah Khamenei was apparently referring to widespread allegations that Tehran is supplying suicide drones to Russia amidst the conflict with Ukraine. Moscow has been actively using the Tehran to suicide drones in recent weeks to strike critical infrastructure and military targets in Ukraine. Footage of the drones and wreckage collected by the Ukrainians suggests that they closely resemble the Iranian-made Shahid-136. Kiev and some of its Western backers have directly accused Iran of supplying those drones to Russia. And in his usual night video address, Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky says Russia has destroyed three Ukrainian energy facilities over the last 24 hours. According to a regional governor, a Russian missile struck a, a thermal power station in the city of Bushtin in western Ukraine. Mr. Zelensky, who has said a third of his country's power stations have been hit by Russian strikes, discussed security at, uh, at power supply plants with senior officials. We have new damages to critical infrastructure today. Three energy facilities were destroyed by the enemy. Of course, we will do everything possible to restore the normal energy capabilities of our country. But it takes time, and this requires our joint efforts tomorrow, even more than before. We are getting ready for all kinds of scenarios in view of the winter season. We proceed from the assumption that Russian terror will be directed at energy facilities until, with the help of our partners, we are able to shoot down 100% of enemy missiles and drones. Now, after Kiev appealed for ways to counter Iranian-made drones being used by Russia, allegedly, Israel has offered to help Ukrainians develop air attack alerts for civilians, signaling a softening of a policy of non-military intervention in the war. Ukraine's ambassador, however, asked for systems that would shoot down the drones instead, while Defense Minister Benny Gantz said Israel was firm on not supplying Kiev with actual weapons. I must emphasize that Israel stands with Ukrainian people and with the West 
Uh, we maintain a policy of supporting Ukraine via humanitarian aids. However, I, for operational and regional consideration, uh, I don't see us sending uh, offensive military equipment. Maybe we can support them with an early warning system that will allow them to alert the right population in a more accurate manner. Let's talk now to Captain Bish Johnson, retired U.S. Army Captain and National Defense and Military Strategist. He joins us virtually uh, from Abuja. Good morning to you, Captain Johnson. Thank you for your time. Let me, let me uh, start by asking, what do you make of this, uh, I don't know whether to call it controversy over these uh, suicide drones, uh, what they're calling kamikaze drones, uh, being made in Iran and being supplied to Russia. The Russians say that they are, in fact, manufacturing the drones that they're using. But the Iranians, uh, the, the supreme leader of Iran, has uh, praised the effect of these drones, even while not saying that they are the ones who are supplying them to Russia, uh, uh, on the other hand. But the point is, these drones are highly effective. As the Ukrainians themselves have admitted, more than 30%, in some cases up to now, 40% of their infrastructure uh, for energy has been uh, uh, damaged in just a couple of days of the strikes. Yeah, what, what you have seen with um, Ukraine, um, is indicative of the fact that the Russians under the uh, Ukrainians, they are this underestimated the resistance that the Ukrainians were going to put up. So what the Russians have resorted in doing is, you know, use of missiles and artillerys and now with these suicide drones, uh, because they are military to be able to carry out offensive or counter-offensive operations within Ukraine. It's, you know, some um, areas of it. Those drones were supplied by the Iranians. Even before those drones were being deployed, they had picked up, you know, discussions and even visits to um, Iran respect to negotiations on the supply of these drones. Russia, throughout this whole conflict, has been in denying everything. And American intelligence has been consistent from that period. And so if I am to believe, I would believe the Americans, based on the fact that their intelligence had been proven to the point we are right now. Let, uh, let, let's look at the other side of this. Everybody accepts that the Russians are able to do this because the Ukrainians have virtually no air defenses. Uh, they have no way of controlling their skies or defending themselves against these missiles and these drones. Uh, so they have asked for equipment and weapons to do just that. But it seems as if the Western countries are very reluctant to give them such weapons uh, uh, to... Uh, you know, control their airspace. You heard the Israeli defense minister there saying, look, we possibly we could, you know, give you uh, early warning uh, systems, but no actual weapons to bring down the drones and the missiles, which is what the Ukrainians want. This is uh, some kind of, I don't know whether to call it politics, or is it a question of nobody wanting to tangle directly with the Russians? Well, there are several factors for that. You know, every country is your country's interest. Uh, the Israelis, for example, uh, want to try to balance, you know, their uh, relationship with the West. And um, there is no particular region or country that has all the answers. So every um, challenge, which they all do, uh, go out to several countries and solutions to their problems. Now, I don't, this is where I just don't understand. I don't understand why the way in supplying the Ukrainians, particularly air defense systems, 
this um, uh, Russian uh, missiles, the entire landscape of the Ukrainians are not just only devastating a, a, a building, you know, killing humans. So that's what I don't understand. Recent events, particularly, I, I've had you in your earlier call, lost over 40% of their, their, their power. The Western allies of Ukraine uh, to be able to that and the equipment that they have been asking for, particularly air defense equipment. There are some equipment that can be jamming those doors and the chance of even hitting any target. I am hoping going on right now in Ukraine that uh, the Western Alliance should be able to go asking for for day for, for months. All right, then, indeed, uh, Captain uh, Bish Johnson, thank you uh, for that. Uh, uh, we'll, 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 of course, uh, have you back uh, to discuss military strategy in, uh, in the coming days, because it seems as if uh, both sides are adopting different tactics uh, now in, in, in this war. And I, I, I'd like to take that up with you, uh, if I may, at, at, uh, at a future date. Thank you so much for being with us. I, I, will, I will be glad to call. Thank because so all much. the attention of the world seems to be. All right, uh, Captain be... Bruce Johnson, of course, is uh, a military and defense uh, strategist joining us virtually from Abuja. Leaders of the 27 European Union countries met today for the second time in a fortnight to try to bring down energy prices. The 27 EU countries are expected to back an alternative price benchmark for liquefied natural gas and joint gas buying after earlier agreeing to cut consumption and introduce levies on windfall profits in the energy industry. But the remainers split as they were months ago on whether and how to cap gas prices to stem high inflation and stave off recession after a Russia caught gas flows following its invasion of Ukraine. I know that Europeans are concerned. Concerned about inflation, concerned about the energy bills, concerned about the winter, the best response to Putin's gas blackmail is European solidarity and European unity. And in this spirit, in this spirit, the Commission agreed yesterday on a strong legislative framework to address the energy crisis. This is a good package because this is a good basis building uh, on the tools we had in the past in order, to, in order to take additional steps and to clarify what we want for the future. The European Council tomorrow will be difficult. It will be complex because there are different sensitivities, different opinions. We do not have all the same starting points, but I see two important elements. First question, are we ready to work together in order to implement measures to lower the prices of gas? Meanwhile, German Finance Minister Christian Lindner says Germany and France have agreed not to fuel inflation by strengthening demand and that governments must not counteract the moves of central banks. According to Economic Minister Robert Habeck, Europe must offer a strong answer to the United States Inflation Reduction Act, which was enticing European companies away, adding that now was not the time for a trade war between the two allies. Also agree on the necessity of reducing our consumption of energy. But there is clearly a need to move faster and to move further. And we will continue to explore together both France and Germany additional measures to move faster and to move f further on this uh, energy question. Our common understanding is that the Franco-German cooperation is part of the European solidarity, which is so important in these times and which was so successful regarding the sanctions and also the cooperation on all energy measures in the past months. Yes, I, I just want to uh, precise that the postponement of the uh, CEFA is linked uh, only to difficulties on the uh, agenda of uh, some ministers, but it has nothing to do with um, any uh, kind of uh, 
political difficulties, it is only linked to agenda complexities. And um, we can't go in a trade war in times like this. We are partners even across the Atlantic. So from the European, from the Franco-German side, this is not only a good development. So we are in good talks with our American partners, but this needs definitely a strong answer, a strong, um, a strong European reply. Coming up after uh, the break, more on uh, the business fallout of all these stories uh, with Amy John McQua. Plus, EU lawmakers award Sakharov Human Rights Prize to the Ukrainian people. All right, a warm welcome back. And Ini John Mekwa joins me as promised at this time. Good morning. Morning, uh, Good morning, morning. Uh, So that yesterday you and uh, Ulumide were having uh, quite a <laughs> yes. tiff off over this issue. Uh, so let, let me take it off from where he stopped uh, uh, today, even though it's not the same subject. Mm -hmm. uh, let, let's start from Belarus, which can make foreign debt payments because of war sanctions. Yeah. This was what Russia, this was the position Russia was in uh, a couple of months ago. Yes. So what are they, what, what, what's this about? <laughs> you know, so I think Belarus is one, well, I, I will not call them victim because they chose to be alliance to Russia, Russia right. you know, but they're getting hit in a lot of ways and it, it seems a lot of eyes are not there. Uh, we know some time ago that Russia did offer some aid to them, right. you know, tried to open some companies and send so some right, money. to give some. Exactly. But they are feeling, imagine Australia increased the tariff on, on, their, on their imports. That if you want to import uh, Belarusian, Belarusians uh, uh, products right. into Australia by 35%. That's a so whole lot. who, yeah. So who are they selling to? Now it's gotten so bad uh, with all of the sanctions from different countries, secondary sanctions and the almost primary sanction because they are like an extension of Russia, Russia at this time. really, and they are being treated as such. They are, yes, they are being treated as that. mention Russia in sanctions, they say, and Belarus. And Belarus. And, and the president is not backing down. He said he's going to send his guys to, to uh, join in the fight. Fight, yeah. You know, so, I mean... And it's a small country. They don't have so much of economic uh, uh, strength like Russia to be able to withstand. So Russia, Russia really has to come to, to their aid because now they cannot pay their debts. They are owing. World Bank said they have to put it on uh, a non-performing status. Yes, status because they are not able to pay. And, and what, now it's we're talking about almost seventy million dollars. That's just a bit of it. That's not the total foreign debt that they have. That's just a bit of it. And what it means is they can't go to any country. You know, because Australia, for instance, has already sent word to all of the institutions that they cannot get loans from them. That's so right. now, if World Bank and IMF has has them as uh, uh, non-performing, non -perform uh, they can't go to anywhere. That's like a death sentence. Except Russia. Maybe Russia will be there. Uh, come to their aid. And, and it, 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 in the days to come, of course, we'll have to see how they're, they're, they're doing how they're doing that. But on one hand, that is on one hand, we're talking about Belarus and the problem. On the other hand, the people who have put Belarus under sanctions are themselves having difficulties now. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, when I was talking to uh, my, my first guest, I mentioned uh, the issue of price caps. Mm -hmm. And even though there have been several meetings over the last couple of months over this matter, there has been no agreement. It's difficult. Price caps are really difficult because, okay, for instance, um, the, the West, US, and EU, they've been talking about putting a price cap on global oil for Russia, Russian oil, so that they can sell beyond a certain price. But that's difficult because if countries like China, India, and remember we counted some other countries that have joined that league, Cuba and all of yeah, that. Yeah, but who know? kept below the radar because they didn't want to be put <laughs> exactly. on the... Yes. <laughs> you know, so if those countries feel that they are in need and so they are reaching out to tell Russia, we really want to buy your oil, how are you as a third party going to intervene in that yeah, and the prices at which they sell it and the remember we also had the discussion where you you mentioned that they were giving them discounts even 30 more dollars, discounts. 30 dollars less than the normal price so if oil is going for 90 dollars those These who are buying are from are Germany are 60 dollars 
you know. So what price cap would you want to put there? But that's one price cap. Now, the other price cap they are trying to do, the EU nations, uh, with their meet meeting today and tomorrow right. on their own gas and their own energy. energy. So, you know, UK tried it. Uh, well, I don't know if it's, how it's going to work with, with the problem that uh, Prime Minister... Trust, yeah, because that might be, end now. up being her downfall now. Yeah, mm -hmm. because so they don't want uh, energy prices to go beyond a certain level. I know they said in UK it's supposed to be a maximum of 2,005 Which pounds. Which those there are still complaining about. Yes, but now they, they, you know they've reduced it now. It's supposed to end, I think, by the end of 2024. Right. Now they've reduced it to April next year, which is just a couple of months, <laughs> you know, to show you that it's not really easy because what happens is um, the people who are supplying the energy will not have the fund to go back to the market to bring up the production if you put on price cap, except as a government, you are ready to pay. Now, if you want to pay as a government, where are you getting the money from? Because at this time, there's inflation. At this time, production cost is high. At this time, taxes are high. Dollar is surging. You know, so as a country... Your income has reduced. Your purchasing power has That's reduced. Also dropped, right. You know, and a lot of countries are servicing debts. So if the dollar is surging, that means your debt servicing is of going course, up. Of course, it's also going up. So Even when, Nigeria is affected no, by that. Let, that Okay. Okay, okay, that's for business. Sorry, that's for business money. Let me not go there at this point. Okay. 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 So, you know, if, if governments or countries do not have that much money, then they cannot confidently say, oh, we're going to subsidize the energy costs so that individuals can have a price cap. So it's really difficult for them. So we see um, some countries in the EU are eager to have that price cap on their gas, you know, because gas according to them the price went as much as 300 i think 343 euros for one megawatt one hour megawatts of supply right. in august that's like the highest they've had you know so they are finding it difficult to have that cap because who's going to pay for it? The government is not so buoyant at this time. Uh, revenues are not coming in. Liquidity is squeezed, you know, so it's not so easy to come, especially for a country like Germany. I think that's the biggest economy there. there they, are and, the and ones they are the ones who most hit. <laughs> on, 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 on that point, of course, we'll keep an eye on that meeting. As Ini said, it's today and tomorrow. We'll like, of course, we'll report back on, on the outcome. Uh, but as uh, and he said there are some other things that are being kept for business <laughs> for morning. Business. So oh. watch, watch, watch out for that right after this program. But for now, thank, thank you. Thank you. Amy. Thank you so much for having me. Let's uh, take a look at some of the sport. Uh, International Olympic Committee President Thomas Bach has rushed to the defense of a Russian and Belarusian delegates uh, when their presence at the Association of National Olympic Committees General Assembly in Seoul uh, was criticized. Uh, the IOC recommended banning Russian teams and athletes from sports when the military operation in Ukraine broke out in late February. Mr. Bach said that now is not the time to lift the ban, but drilled home the message that athletes should never be the victims of the policies of their own countries. A Moscow district court has ordered U.S. tech giant Meta to pay uh, 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 over a million uh, uh, dollars in compensation to former Russian international footballer Dmitry Kolov. Uh, the case involved claims that Facebook had frequently blocked his name by interpreting it as an insult towards Ukrainians. Uh, Meta was also uh, ordered to unblock all references to Kolov on its social media networks. The court noted that the decision was made without the presence of representatives from Meta, although the company has the right to appeal. And finally, on the program, the European Parliament, in its annual prize for freedom of thought to honor uh, decided to honor the Ukrainians in the fight against Russia's invasion. The parliament has awarded the people of Ukraine, represented by their president, Vladimir Zelensky, the Sakharov Prize for Human Rights. The European Parliament president, Roberta Metzola, said, quote, they are standing up for what they believe in, fighting for our values, protecting our democracy, freedom, and rule of law, risking their lives for us. Uh, Metzola continued to say that there was no one more deserving of this prize. The award comes with a prize money of 50,000 euros, which the European Union said would be distributed to representatives of Ukrainian civil society.
That's our program this morning. Thanks for being with us. My name is Ladi Akiri Doloali. This is our day at 5 o'clock within the world today. But before that, throughout uh, the day on our various uh, news programs, we have updates on the war in uh, Ukraine. But for now, do have yourselves a pleasant day ahead. Good morning.